privilege to be with you. I just want to be sure that the audio is coming across. I had difficulty hearing your audio, but okay, fine. Very good then. It's a go. Thanks very much and appreciate all that have taken time to come and sit under the sound of the word of God. Now we're looking tonight, today rather, at the assembly, the letter to the assembly that was in Thyatira. So we'll commence in chapter number two and verse number 18 and read together the the longest, actually, of the letters to any of the seven churches. Unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, or love, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and hearts. I want to give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not known the doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power or authority over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father, and I will give him the morning star. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. I'm sure God will add blessing to the public reading of his word of truth. Just a little background here as we approach the letter to the church at Thyatira, which will help us to appreciate some of what the Lord is saying and why he so addresses them. Thyatira was probably the least impressive of all the seven cities. It was not a political center so or a military center so much as a commercial area. And it was occupied by many trade guilds, which would be the equivalent today of our labor unions. To belong to a trade guild had some implications. Every trade guild was was headed up by one of the gods or, or idols. And each year to belong to that guild, you had to pay homage to the idol and had to offer incense to the idol and had to worship the idol. So, of course, believers who were true to the Lord Jesus Christ would not become involved in the trade guilds. That would, of course, mean difficulty with employment, difficulty with work and so on. But it was the price they paid for for faithfulness. The pagan gods demanded fidelity and faithfulness, and if you were not faithful to the god, you could not belong to the trade guild, and as a result, were out of work. You'll notice as well that we have the mention of Jezebel here, and so as, we had, as we've noticed with the other churches, there's a corresponding period in Israel's history that parallels what we have here in the church in Thyatira. And we're not left to guessing what that is because we have Jezebel's name introduced. And the conditions in Thyatira, as we'll notice, were very, very similar to the days of Ahab and to that of Jezebel. And the idolatry and immorality and iniquity that they brought into the nation of Israel in the north. And the eventual demise of the nation as a result of their sin and their idolatry. So that is part of the background here. As I mentioned, this is the longest of the seven letters written to the church at Thyatira. It is also the central church of the seven. So it seems to stand out alone for some very, very particular and very special reasons. It really was only about 40 miles away from Pergamos, the church we looked at previously, a city that was founded by Alexander, and what I find interesting about the church at Thyatira, you could write over it, actually, a tale of two sisters. Because as you recall, 
we have a sister from Thyatira mentioned in Acts chapter 16, Lydia from Thyatira, a seller of purple. I mentioned as well before, it was a commercial center. It was known especially for its dyeing of goods. And Lydia was the individual mentioned in Acts chapter 16 who came from Thyatira and who was saved when Paul came to Philippi. Lots of conjectures about the origin of the assembly at Thyatira since we need we don't read anything other than what we have in Acts 16 and what we have here in Revelation 2. Some conjecture, and we certainly can't debate it, that Lydia, upon getting saved, went back to Thyatira, spread the gospel, and ultimately an assembly was formed there. If so, then it is certainly the a tale of, of, of two sisters, one who saw the assembly initially started through her testimony, and the other who saw the assembly corrupted by her testimony. And we'll notice some of those features as we look at the chapter in more detail. So with that before us, I want you to think, first of all, of the Lord and his perception. The Lord Jesus introduces himself to the church here with three different phrases. First of all, he is the son of God. Secondly, he is the one we read of whose, whose eyes are as a flame of fire. And thirdly, his feet like unto fine brass. Thus saith the son of God. I would take it that that particular phraseology is used to contrast with Jezebel, who is teaching my servants. But here is what the Son of God says to his servants. So we are reminded then of the of the Lord Jesus coming, and we see, first of all, his personal dignity. He is the Son of God. Now, those that like to parallel church history in the seven churches would, of course, parallel this with the rise of Romanism, and the spread of Romanism after Constantine and its eventual taking over of Christendom and all that went with it of false teaching and all that went with it of Mary instead of Jesus being the prime source of intercession and the occupation of the church. And of course, there are parallels that can be seen here. And I think that if you want to look at that line, there certainly are many, many helps paralleling Thyatira with Romanism. But however, we're looking at the personal dignity, first of all, of him who is the, the son of God. This is the only place I think, I'm open to correction, but I think this is the only place in Revelation where he presents himself in this title as the son of God. In all the dignity of his deity and majesty, he presents himself to this assembly in contrast to their corruption and in contrast to their behavior. So we have, first of all, then, his personal dignity. But then we have his penetrating scrutiny. His eyes are like flames of fire. He was introduced to us in that way in chapter 1, and now that is borrowed here to remind us that he is aware of everything that is going on in the assembly. Nothing in an assembly misses his scrutiny. Very sobering and solemn truth, something that should cause us to move very carefully in assembly testimony. If we were conscious of his eyes upon all of our decisions and actions in the assembly, it likely would change some of our behavior and would control us more. You recall that when Paul was writing to the Philippian assembly with their internal problems, he told them to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. I think the salvation mentioned there has nothing to do with anything individual but rather the salvation of the assembly from the potential problem it was facing with the dissension between the sisters that were there and the persecution they were facing. But what I want to emphasize is they were to work it out with fear and trembling, a fear of grieving God and a trembling lest they should in any way miss the will of God. Moving in the fear of God is not the idea of a dread, but rather it is the idea of Above, above everything else, not wanting to grieve him, not wanting to displease him, a desire above all else to please him. So we're reminded here then of the penetrating scrutiny of the Lord Jesus. And then his feet are like fine brass, reminded there then of his perfect consistency. Not only could he see the problem, but he could also move in judgment to bring things into a line and bring things into correction. His desire was to see the assembly act in corrective 
discipline, whatever was needed, but he would eventually move if necessary if they did not. Now you'll notice in these three features, the son of God, his eyes like flames of fire, his feet like fine brass. We have the three attributes of deity. We have his, um, first of all, his omnipresence, his omniscience, he knows all, his omnipotence, he can correct all. So we see the absolute deity of the Lord Jesus brought in here in contrast to the very, very debased, almost demeaning uh, picture of the Lord Jesus that was being taught by, by Jezebel, as we'll see in a few moments. So we reminded then of the, the Lord and his perception. Then we are reminded that of his commendation, the labor that was prominent amongst them. We see the prominence of the word, just the word works, found in verse 19 twice, verse 22, verse 23, verse 26. Here's an assembly that was active, the prominence of their works. There was also, in some measure, among some of the faithful here, prosperity in, in their work. Thyatira, you notice he speaks of their love in verse number 19. He That was what was lacking at Ephesus. He speaks of their faith which was seen at Smyrna. He speaks of their ministry and their endurance, which was also seen at Pergamos. So in a sense, they were bringing together all of the good elements of the previous three churches, and they were all seen in the assembly here at Thyatira. And of course, instead of resting on their success, I would take it that what he says in verse 19, he begins with their works, and he ends with their works, and says the last is more than the first. They were not content just with what they had done already. They were they were redoubling their efforts to seek to honor him. So there was progress, even though there was failure on, on the part of some in the assembly. So it is a reminder that however dark the day, however difficult it may be, it is always possible to make progress for God and to seek to honor him in what we do. So here was an assembly. And they were facing a great challenge. It was a dark day. It's often been said that the, the darker the day, the greater the deed. The, de the day defines the deed. As more the, the more difficult it might be, the greater pleasure God the greater the pleasure that God receives from his people. Recall that there was a day when David was sitting upon the throne. If you had brought David beans and basins and bowls, when he was sitting in luxury in his throne in Jerusalem, it would have meant very little. But there was a day when he had to flee from Absalom. And when he did, Barzillai brought beds and basins and bowls and beans, things that were of seemingly little value, but to a rejected king in a dark day, they were a great blessing. And so the day defines the deed. And God appreciates difficulties that believers have to work through. So they were faced with a great challenge. They were marked by even greater con conduct, as I mentioned. They rose to the challenge, and their last works were more than their first. They were progressing and seeking to do more for God as they were able to as time went on. And then we have even the, the greatest commendation to this assembly. Six things are mentioned. This is the largest commendation given to any of the churches. Now, he's going to speak very glowingly of course, of Philadelphia, but as far as things that are listed, which he is marking his appreciation and giving his, his blessing to, this church actually has the, the greatest number of things mentioned in the catalog of issues that are commended. So they are marked by the, the greatest commendation in that sense. But then along with the, the Lord and his perception, the labor and their and its prominence. Tragically, there was leaven that was permeating the assembly. There was a teacher. I find it very distressing. Let's assume that these letters were written probably in a roughly AD 90. So we're looking at 30 years after the passing of the apostle Paul and Peter. Suddenly you find false doctrine prospering in local assemblies. To me, that is just a sign of just how quickly and easily truth can be 
twisted, denied, and false doctrine brought in. So we see this woman who was a teacher. She was in rebellion against divine order. We have, first of all, brought before us her, her self-appointment. She calls herself a prophetess. Now, very likely, this is what gave her some footing in the assembly to begin teaching things that were wrong. We have her self-appointment. Her sovereign assertion that what she was teaching was divine truth. And yet it was anything but divine truth, but that was what she was asserting. And we have the uh, sinful activity that marked us, teaching to eat things offered to idols. It's difficult to know here, and um, I certainly cannot be dogmatic, whether this adultery and fornication was literal or whether it was figurative of the fact that she was probably encouraging some to join the trade guilds and just offer something to the idol. She would possibly even quote Paul's words to the Corinthians that an idol is nothing and it means nothing and it's just an empty thing and uh, so on. So it may be that she was linking it with that. However, coupled with that was the fact that linked with many of the idolatrous feasts was immorality. Many of the idols of the heathens, the fertility idols and some of the other idols, they would have actual, tragically, orgies linked with their religious festivals. So it could be that this was all very literal, that she was encouraging adherence to the requirements of the idol's temple and the idol's feast, and encouraging believers to become involved in that type of thing. Whatever the case, what she was teaching was sinful and was abhorrent to the Lord. She's marked also by stubborn adamancy. She would not repent. The Lord gave her time to repent. Now, whether it was through ministry given in the assembly, whether it was through prophetic utterances, whatever it may be, in some way, God made very clear to her the wrong of her teaching. And he dealt with, he was going to deal with her if she did not in any way repent of her deeds, which she had refused to do up to this point. So she was opposing divine truth. She was in rebellion against divine patience. She introduced idolatry, immorality, iniquity, and insisted that she, what she had to say was inspired by God. So we see the evil that marked this woman in her place in the assembly. Of course, it is very reminiscent, isn't it, of the real Jezebel back in the book of First Kings and all that she introduced in a Baal worship into the northern kingdom and her self-assertion, her manipulation. She had a very weak husband, and that might be reflected in the fact that she was suffered, allowed, or tolerated to teach. It may be that there was a weakness in leadership in the assembly that permitted this. But there certainly are many parallels between Jezebel in the Old Testament and this woman who receives the name, likely because of what she was doing, she's labeled here as Jezebel. It may not have been her real name, but nevertheless, she's labeled as Jezebel because of her activity. So we have the fact that she is deceiving the people of God, and God refers to those she is deceiving as his servants, and they have been serving God, but now this woman is teaching a doctrine that is going to hinder their service for God, and so on. So we see the subtle attack of Satan upon the servants of God and their labor. Now, if you'll just allow me for a few moments to digress, because it is very easy to be very negative towards our sisters, and yet they are to be prized and valued for all that they mean to God's assembly. So if you'll just allow me to say a few very positive things about our sisters and their value to a local assembly. I would say that you could not have an assembly without sisters because of a couple of things. First of all, the symbol and its significance. Our sisters, when we are gathered together as an assembly, have two symbols that speak two tremendously valuable messages. Their long hair represents their submission to the headship of men, the man, in the natural order of God's creation. Their long hair is given them as a sign, as a symbol of their place in God's natural creation, creation order. Their covered heads speak of the headship of Christ in the redemptive order. So a sister 
is giving testimony to a truth that is nowhere else proclaimed in all of the universe. Her symbol, her covered head, is not merely a custom, but it is a tremendous truth being proclaimed to angels and to the onlooking universe. You recall in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says, For this cause ought the women to have a sign of authority on their head because of the angels. Now, I think there's great significance there. If you go back to Genesis, and you will find there in Genesis, the first uttered words from an angel's mouth. It's the angel of the Lord who confronts the Hagar as she is escaping from, from Sarah and her ill treatment. The, re, the words of the angels were, the angel of the Lord was to return and submit. Angels have a great fascination with the topic of submission. And the reason is very simple. You recall that there were angels who kept not their first estate. They refused to submit. So there was a time in heaven when angels who were able to actually see the glory of God, standing before the throne of God, serving the throne of God, a day came when under the control of Satan, they rebelled and refused to submit to divine order. And now angels are looking on at women, at sisters, who intelligently and voluntarily are taking a place of submission. So it is a tremendous lesson. Angels are being taught as they observe our sisters in God's assembly. So the symbol and its significance, not, a visit, not available anywhere else in all of God's creation, except in gatherings of God's people where sisters have their heads covered. But also their silence and their spirituality. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and 1 Timothy chapter 2 both enjoin upon our sisters a place of submission and a place of assistance in God's assembly. But their silence is really, in 1 Corinthians 14, linked with spirituality. He enjoins silence on three groups of people in 1 Corinthians 14. There is a person with a tongue that no one can interpret. He is to keep silence. There is the prophet who is speaking and another one comes and has a message from God and he is the, he is then to keep silence and let another speak and then he speaks of the sisters being in silence and subjection as also says the law and he says that he he winds it all up he summarizes it all by saying if any man be spiritual let him acknowledge the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord so a sister by her attitude to the word of God by her submission to scriptures, is indicating a spiritual character that brings the light to the heart of God. Remember, God is pleased by obedience. We sometimes think our service is the most important thing. God finds great pleasure in obedience. Has the Lord as great delight in offerings and in sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, to hearken than the fat of rams. So that our sisters, by their submission to the word of God, bring pleasure to the heart of God. But then we're reminded as well, her subjection and her salvation, they are linked together in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Now, there is a misunderstanding, I think, in the minds of many when we come to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and the sisters' silence at a prayer meeting. Eve is introduced there as having been deceived. And Adam was not deceived. Adam was led along by her. And then we have that injunction that the sisters should keep silence at a prayer meeting. Some would take it that what is being mentioned there is that because the woman was deceived and gave to her hus husband and he did eat, that she's being punished. Nothing could be further from the truth. What the Spirit of God is indicating there is just this. When divine order was reversed... When Eve took the lead and Adam followed her lead, disaster occurred. Now he says, I want divine order to be maintained where men are in the lead and women are in submission. I want divine order to be maintained in God's assembly. Remember that the place of a sister in God's assembly has nothing to do with inferiority or superiority. Personhood is absolutely equal in the assembly. Position differs. 
God has given the position of leadership and public participation to the male and the place of silence and submission to the sister. And so she is able by her submission in God's assembly to add value to the assembly meeting. But I think if you look at the context of 1 Timothy chapter 2, there's even greater truth involved. He stresses two things relative to the sisters in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Number one is her dress, her appearance, not with gold and broidered hair and costly array, but what becometh a woman professing godliness, she's marked by good works and by godliness. And then he mentions as well her submission and silence in the assembly. Now, why is that important? What are the men praying for earlier in the chapter? They are praying for men, for kings, those who are in authority, to be able to submit to the word of God. Now, if sisters at the prayer meeting do not submit to the word of God, how can the men logically get up and pray that ungodly men will submit to the word of God? Secondly, in praying for their salvation, what we're praying for really is that they will recognize that the spiritual is more important than the material, and the eternal more important than the temporal. And so he says, if the women come, and all they care about is their appearance, that they're outdoing each other in dress and finery. Now, please, don't misunderstand me. Our sisters should be dressed nicely. They should be dressed appropriately. And there's nothing, they don't have to go to secondhand stores to get their clothes. There is nothing wrong with looking nice and being well attired. But if the emphasis is all on the outward, the material, and the finery. He says, that's so inconsistent with what you're praying for. So the sister by her submission to the word of God and by her appearance is actually adding weight and value to the public prayers of the brethren. So she is actually given a tremendous role to play in God's assembly, even though it may be one of silence. Keep in mind that the two occasions where we have worship ointment and oil poured upon the Lord Jesus Christ, whereby women. Luke chapter 7, the woman that was a sinner making her way to his feet in the house of the Pharisee. And of course, Mary in John chapter 12 and in Matthew and Mark, anointing his head, anointing his feet. Both of those were silent worshipers. They never said a word, but they worshiped silently. And yet the Lord appreciated it. In fact, if you look at Luke chapter 7, he knew everything the woman did. He knew how long she had done it for. He speaks of since the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. And so he was perfectly aware of all, even though no words were exchanged and nothing was said. So our sisters should be encouraged that in their silent prayer, in their silent worship, in their silent thanksgiving, they are bringing pleasure and delighting the heart of the Lord Jesus. And he appreciates and is aware of every bit of it. And finally, we have the, the sphere the sisters are given to serve in. They do have a teaching ministry, Titus chapter 2. They are teaching the younger women, teaching them things that Timothy would be out of order trying to teach them. How to please their husbands, how to raise their children, how to be the help they can be in God's assembly. It's not a minor role. It's a very major role. I've often mentioned in speaking about the role of women in the home that the woman is, Eve was made to be a help meet for Adam, a help suitable for Adam. If you look up that word help, you'll find it is used, for example, in Psalm 121. Shall I look unto the hills? From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord. Hosea 14, God speaking to Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thy help. So that we find that many, many times that same word help is used of, of God himself in his relationship to Israel. So it is not a minor role, but a very major role that she plays in the Christian home and in the Christian assembly. So her ministry is very clearly defined and it is very limited, but very, very useful and very, very valuable because it cannot be done by the men, that very private, personal approach in dealing with issues. So the leaven that was permeating nevertheless was, can be, can be, uh, seen in contrast to what God intends for the role of sisters in, in God's assembly, a very valuable and a role that the men cannot play. Teaching, they, symbols and teaching, they cannot portray, but our sisters are privileged to, to do so. 
But then the Lord puts his finger upon laxity that was being permitted. He speaks here of the, uh, to the assembly. I, I take it he's really speaking to the leadership I, that they were suffering that woman Jezebel to teach and to seduce. So there was tolerance of evil. I, we touched on this last week, so I don't want to belabor the point. We live in an age of tolerance. Any objection, we all know to the current trends in society, is viewed as intolerant speech, even labeled sometimes as hate speech. You have to be tolerant of everything. Nothing can be called evil. Relativism and individualism has all brought us down to this point in time where everything is tolerated. Nothing can be said to be absolute truth. Everything is relative. And you're welcome to your opinion as long as you keep it to yourself and don't try to push it on anyone else. So here there was an assembly that leadership that was being tolerant of evil and of not dealing with this particular problem and not dealing with it as God intended it to do so. We always have to remember that love that sometimes can be used as an excuse for tolerance. Love is marked by a love for righteousness and a hatred for lawlessness so that we can never use the banner of love to excuse our tolerance for evil. As I mentioned, it's interesting that the Old Testament Jezebel was married to a very weak husband. You recall how she manipulated him in the death of Naboth, and he didn't seem to be able to stand against his wife, and yet she was able to manipulate and use him for her own wicked ends. And it was taking a toll on the assembly. Not only was the assembly in danger, their separation was compromised, their sanctity was being marred. The assembly was in very, very dangerous condition. Then there was the, the loss that was promised. On Jezebel herself, she was going to endure great tribulation. Now, this is not the great tribulation. We're not looking at that. She's going to endure great sorrow, great difficulty, great problems. On her companions, they're going to experience with her the same kind of punishment. And then on the fruit of her teaching, whether literal men, literal children, offspring, or whether we're just looking at the fruit of what she was teaching, God was going to judge it as well. All that is done in rebellion against God's word will ultimately come to naught. It may look good. It may appear to have prospered, link with it at the time. But ultimately, it comes under divine judgment. Reminded here that uh, we had those back in the days of Jezebel. You recall all of the priests of, of Jezebel that were eventually slain when Elijah confronted the priests on Mount, uh, on the mountain with the sacrifice. But think as well, not only of that, but think of the man who compromised himself. If you go back to the days of Ahab and Jezebel, there was an Obadiah who said he feared the Lord, but he was compromised. He was working under Ahab and carrying out Ahab's will and Ahab's work, fearful of Ahab's judgment on him. So we have those who are influenced by Jezebel and by Ahab as well. But against all of that, I think we have reminded here about those who will come to it in a moment. <laughs> those who are holding fast, but going to speak to the remnant in just a moment. Remember from back there, there was a man who was faithful to God despite the price he paid. There's a man named Naboth. He would not sell his vineyard. He would not give up the inheritance of his fathers to Ahab. We have a great inheritance. Now, I'm not just speaking of tradition. I know there is tradition that is man-made. Some of it is beneficial to us as far as our order and so forth. But I'm speaking about the inheritance of the scriptures that we have received from previous generations. We owe a great debt to men that went before us. They may not have been perfect. Some of them may have tended towards legalism and all the rest. I'm well aware of that. I'm well aware that we have lots of blots and blemishes ourselves, but we do owe a great debt to a previous generation that has handed us a rich 
inheritance passed down from generation to generation. And we don't want to sell our inheritance, trade it for something that Ahab would give us. We want to maintain it and be like a Naboth. It cost Naboth his life. It's very costly to be faithful to God. So I just want to continue here by reminding you then of the of the lessons that we have to learn from this. First of all, the character of the Lord who searches the reins and the hearts. Now, the reins in the Old Testament, the word literally means kidney. So we've got to go back to how people thought in that day. Here were the motivating factors. This was used as the, uh, the idea of something that motivated. And of course, the heart is the affection. So we have our, our motives and our affections, our will and our affections all linked together. He says, I, I, I'm able to search out what really is the basic motive. There may have been nice superficial attempt to whitewash and spiritualize and bring verses in out of context to try to make this look like what she was teaching was the right thing. But he says, I know the motives behind it. I know what's really behind what she's doing and what she's trying to accomplish. And I know where her affections really lie. And he knows that of all of us as well. It may have been a desire for place and prominence, influence and power, whatever it may be. He sees everything, whether it's the behavior of an Ananias and Sapphira who will lie and deceive, whether it is what's going on in the assembly at Corinth with their immorality, whatever it may be, he's aware of it. The consequences of their laxity is that he was going to give them according to their works. He will move in judgment according to the evil which they have done, compensating them, reaping what they have sown. But then there is compensation for, for loyalty. You notice that he says that he will reward others who have been loyal to him during this period when the false teachers are so prominent. He mentions here, I will in verse the end of verse 23, I will give unto every one of you according to your works. So whether evil or good, he will recompense. Of course, for the believer, that is future for the most part. Although he does recompense in this life with blessing, for most for the most part, it is future, the beam of the judgment seat of Christ when he will give rewards. And so we have then the loyalty that he prizes brought before us here. He recognized the, their limitations, but to the remnant, to the rest, that were not holding this doctrine and not knowing the deep things of Satan, those who were faithful to divine truth, standing for God in adverse circumstances. Not easy. Difficult to go it alone. Now, I know this is not true of assembly and not true certainly of the assembly at Connors Hill, but both in Psalm number one, where we read about the blessed man, and in Second Timothy chapter three, where we read about the, the man of God, you notice in Psalm number one, it's the man that doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. All of those are in the plural. The man of God is in the singular. Likewise, or rather the, the blessed man is in the singular. Likewise, 2 Timothy chapter 3, evil men and seducers shall whack worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. They're in the plural, but the man of God is in the singular. Just a reminder that living for God in every age means going against the tide, standing alone against opposition and against numbers. And yet we have tremendous resources for that. We have the word of God, the indwelling spirit. We have the Lord Jesus Christ as our great high priest. We have every resource God can give us in a difficult day. So the Lord recognizes the limitations. He encourages as well in their labor. What you've already done, keep on doing as he says there to them. Uh, I will put upon you none other burden. Just keep going. But what you have already done, hold fast till I come. In dark days, in difficult days, avoid a spirit of negativism. Avoid a feeling as though we're, what's the use we have to give up. The Lord wants us to keep going, to seek to maintain testimony, to seek to honor him by continuing to serve him. And now he gives us the first reference to his coming hold fast till i come a very precious thing i would like you to appreciate and it's this 
whatever the Lord Jesus spoke of his coming to reign over the earth and to judge and to come to the nation of Israel as their redeemer, as their savior, he speaks in the third person. When the son of man comes, will he find faith on the earth? When the son of man comes, all nations will be gathered before him, sheep and goats and so on. Rather consistently, he speaks in the third person of his return to the nation of Israel, his return to judge the earth. Whenever he speaks of his coming for the church, he speaks in the first person singular, I come, I come. His first introduction in John chapter 14, I go, I come. John chapter 21, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Revelation 22, the spirit and the bride say come, and so on, I come quickly, and so forth. The same thing here, I come. It is always in the first person, reminding us it's a very personal, a very, very intimate relationship he has with the church, his bride. He will come personally for us. And he always speaks of it in that very personal, intimate way as far as the coming for his church. So reminded here the loyalty that he prizes. And then he closes with this liberality that is going to really recompense and show the pleasure he has had in his own. Now, again, here, many make a strong link with Romanism. It's desire to dominate the world. It's desire for power. It's desire for influence. What the Lord promises here to those who have been faithful to him, he says, I will, to, to those in verse number uh, 26, him that overcometh and keepeth my works, again, his works, unto the end, keep going, don't give up. To him will I give authority over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter, they shall be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father, and I will give him the morning star. So first of all, to those who are faithful to him now, he will give a place of usefulness in a coming day. We are being prepared for reigning with Christ not just in the, in the millennial kingdom, but for all eternity. And here he holds that out as a reminder to those who are seeking to carry on and be faithful to him in a difficult day. He is reminding them of the compensation that awaits the servants of God. Now, what we have here is true for all saints. All of us will reign with him. However, our places of responsibility will vary. I probably quoted it before. I'll quote it again. Mr. Sidney Maxwell used to teach us that we go into heaven based alone on the work of Christ and nothing else. We will come out of heaven based on what we have done for him so that my measure of faithfulness to Christ during my lifetime will determine my place of usefulness in the millennial kingdom and in the eternal kingdom. That we will rule as a result of overcoming. And we will take character from him. He is the one who is going to rule with a shepherd's rod. And as we read of, as we read here in these verses, that uh, having power over the nations and being able to break the vessels with into shivers with a rod of iron. That is what mentioned of him earlier in Revelation and elsewhere. Now, we our, our role will take character from his in a coming day. So we will be given a place to compensate for any suffering, any service, for faithfulness to him down here. Only those who learn to obey and work for him in a difficult day are those who are fit to rule for him in a future day. So there is then something he will give a place of usefulness that will compensate for what has been endured and what has been done for him here. But then also... He gives not only that, but he gives a prospect to cherish, the morning star. It's not that he is just going to appear to a few who are faithful, but this is what is given to the overcomer to encourage and to strengthen and to cheer them on. The, the awareness that a day is coming when the morning star will appear. Again, here we have a reference to his coming, a clear reference to the Lord coming as the morning star. You recall Malachi ends is coming to the nation of Israel as the son of righteousness arising with healing in his wings. To the church, he is seen as the bright 
and morning star, a harbinger of a day to come. And so he gives this to the assembly here in Thyatira as an encouragement, as an incentive, as something to strengthen them as they would seek to serve and honor him in their service and in their lives for him. So we have an assembly here that had a woman teaching totally out of place, totally contrary to the mind of God, marked by her own self-assertion as to what she was, who she was and what she was teaching, claiming inspiration for what she had to say. We're not 100% sure, but possibly leading the servants of God astray by rationalizing and justifying the attendance at the uh, guild that would worship and honor the, the pagan idol and possibly even descending into immorality, whatever it may be. But that was the condition of the assembly. And against that, there were a few, there was the remnant, the rest in Thyatira who were seeking to be faithful, seeking to honor God, seeking to carry on the work of God, despite the dark and difficult day. To these, the Lord holds out tremendous incentives, tremendous encouragement. But really, in the end, the greatest incentive should be that they were pleasing him. If we could just get occupied with pleasing him, even more than just the reward. Our rewards are wonderful. They are, they're valuable. They're, they're important because our rewards will determine our measure of usefulness for him for all eternity and possibly also in some way shape the measure of our ability to worship as we like to. But whatever the case, the ultimate should be that we'd like our lives to be bring pleasure and honor to him. So like in Naboth, in the days of Jezebel, it may require faithfulness even to the point of losing what we have in terms of material things, time, effort, whatever it may be. It will mean sacrifice if we're going to be faithful. But we have to remember he is the one that sacrificed everything for us. So any sacrifice we make is very, very small in comparison to what he has given. I sometimes have difficulty singing Isaac Watts' hymn, We're the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my heart, my life, my all. And while it's true that it does indeed deserve all of that and more, I have difficulty singing it because I really wonder, am I really willing to make that kind of commitment, that kind of sacrifice. Human nature by its essence is very selfish. We learn it more and more as we grow older. And may God give us all grace to seek to serve God with reverence and with godly fear and to recognize that this is what is well-pleasing to him. So we've looked at briefly at the church at Thyatira. Notice what the Lord judges, what the Lord appreciates, and how the Lord will compensate. And the need then to be reminded that God expects assemblies to be well-ordered, to have a leadership that does not tolerate evil, and to be marked by the, the beauty of our sisters who maintain the role and the place that God has given them in his assembly. Again, not an inferior place in the least, but a place of tremendous value and importance, adding character, adding value to every assembly gathering, and seeking by their very demeanor to bring honor to his name. So in the will of the Lord, we will meet again on Wednesday evening and consider the next assembly, the assembly at Sardis. And again, that would parallel, for those that like to parallel church history, the Reformation, Protestantism, and the big movement that occurred in the 16th century, not just beginning with Martin Luther, but probably crystallizing around Martin Luther and the reformers. Now with that, we'll just give ourselves to God in prayer and conclude the meeting. Our Father, we bow together in thy presence and thank thee once more for thy son. We thank thee for anything that can be done to bring pleasure to his heart, to bring honor to his name. We think of what a tremendous privilege it is for sinners who were once absolutely profitless to heaven only an insult and rebellion against thee. And yet now by grace, we were able to serve and bring pleasure to thy heart. Help us, we pray, we might be faithful and might live for the honor and glory of thy name. Remember thy people who have listened so patiently. We commend them to thee. 
pray that I will bless each one, each assembly represented, each home, each family. And now return thanks again for thy kindness to us and for the Lord Jesus above all in his own worthy and precious name. Amen. Thank you again.